Hello all you beautiful people and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you've not been here before or you stumbled onto the page and you like what you are hearing, please hit that subscribe button and make sure to set your notification bell to all because I upload daily and I wouldn't want you to miss your dose of vocal melatonin. If you are interested in becoming a member of Back to Ashes or would like to treat me to a coffee, that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Scary Stories. Right after the intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I used to work at a small neighborhood gas station. I was working an opening shift at 6 a.m. with my best friend and coworker. We were doing our normal opening stuff and the sun came up. I went to get some ice from the back. For reference, the gas station building used to have a drive through so we have that kind of window in the back. I glanced at the back window and realized there was a literal blood print on the back window. I looked closer, and there were smudges of blood around the window handle that looked like somebody was definitely attempting to slide it open. We were really freaked out, so we went to look around other potential entrances around the building. I looked at the window in the front and noticed dried blood on the hole where we take money for gas from outside, like someone was trying to stick their hand in to get to something inside. I keep looking around and there was also dried blood on the front door handles, plus some splatters on the glass like someone was pounding on it. My friend and I were both freaked out at this point. So luckily I had access to the security cameras and I checked them for any motion detected during the night. At 5 a.m. there was a motion capture and we watched as a man with his arms covered in blood walking around the store trying to get in. The freakiest thing was usually the stores open at 5 a.m., but it opened to be a Sunday, so we opened at 6 a.m. Really dodged a bullet there. There were police lights in the distance on the cameras, so we called the sheriff. He showed up pretty quick, watched the security footage, and confirmed it was a guy that they picked up just a bit after 5.30 a.m. Yeah, craziest thing that has ever happened to me in my three and a half years of working at a gas station. Bloody gas station, man. Let's not meet. Okay, every time I remember this event, I cannot stop thinking about it for hours on end, and I need to talk to somebody about it. I'm an adult now, but at the time of this happening, I was in sixth grade, year six or seven, I believe, for anyone in the UK. If you are in the United States, chances are you might remember the clown sightings that were happening in 2016 during the presidential election and leading up to it. For the most part, it was a bunch of college idiots dressing up as clowns and scaring the shit out of people in public. But overall, not too harmful. However, some places had it worse than others. Unfortunately, my old friend and I had one of the more negative encounters. It was early evening. The sun had began to set, and I was staying with one of my friends at their grandparents' place. We were walking around our neighborhood in the nice weather, just hanging out like we typically did. At that point in my life, I never would have been able to just go out with my friend and walk around the neighborhood when it was beginning to get dark, if I had been at my own home. So, we were enjoying the freedom. But that's when we noticed someone. 
standing at the end of a street beside us, just watching, was a damn clown. Obviously, this would be scary to anyone, let alone two 11-year-olds. We tried to ignore him. We sped up and walked the other way, but he followed. We turned a corner and realized he wasn't far behind, so we gave up being subtle and started to run back to my friend's grandmother's house, and the clown ran, too. Luckily, we hadn't gotten too far from the house, and when we got inside, we locked the door, closed the blinds, and ran to tell my friend's grandma. Only issue is that she had been sleeping, and she didn't believe us for a second. At the time, both of us only had iPods. I don't think either of us had a legitimate phone number, so we frantically asked my friend's grandmother to call 911. She refused, still not believing us, and instead of grabbing the home phone and doing it ourselves, because, again, to 11-year-olds, we didn't want to get into trouble. We ran back downstairs, sneaking a look outside. We realized the clown was on the porch, and that's when we saw he was holding a knife. We, at that point, also ran to get a knife and a baseball bat they'd had, and we sat terrified as the grown man tried to open the front door. Perhaps one of the scarier parts of the night was when he realized he couldn't open the front door. He began to walk around the back. I can't fully describe how horrifying it was, watching him and realizing what he was about to do. So we both ran to the back door, locking it before he even showed up. And he did, attempting to open that one too. We were quite literally in a standoff with this jackass dressed like a clown for hours until, like idiots, we both exhaustedly fell asleep on the couch after it had been a while since he made a sound outside. I remember waking up before my friend, still holding a knife and a bat between us, and slowly peeking out from behind the window curtain to see if he was still there. He wasn't. I never saw him again, and we never really spoke about that again. I was too afraid to tell my parents because I worried they wouldn't let me hang out with my friend anymore, and I couldn't imagine my friend really told anyone else, either, after the dismissal. We were saved from the only adult in the house. I was just a child, so my fear was eventually thankfully, replaced with other asinine middle school dramas. But I look back on that today, knowing that there was no way of knowing what his true intentions were. Was he just another college kid being an asshole and trying to scare two little kids? Or was his actions proof enough that he was more sinister? That he had worse plans than he was able to carry out? I'll never know, and with everything I've ever experienced, I can't say with confidence that there is nothing more terrifying than human beings. Hello everybody, this will be my first time ever telling this story to anyone, so Please bear with me, it's very long. I have had plenty of paranormal, spooky, inexplainable things happen throughout my life. It all started when I was around the age of two to about four years old. My mom recently told me that we had lived in a haunted house when I was younger. She always got the heebie-jeebies and she was a very spiritual, inclined. She has a dream and it comes true. I used to tell her about the tall man in my room and wore an old hat. We moved out of that house pretty quickly. After I can't remember much of anything else during that time, we lived in that state. But fast forward to when I was 13 and we moved to a new state. 
We started renting this old farmhouse close to my new school on an old highway. It was a house with an all-glass corner. Before we moved in completely, my mom would talk to her friends at the bar and grill we went to often, and they asked where we moved to. We told them the house with the all-glass corner. Everyone was telling her it was haunted, but she didn't want to hear it as we had nowhere else to go. While we were living there, I had a bunch of scary things happen to me. I would hear voices when I would go to the basement by myself. It sounded like a little girl. I would wake up randomly and see the man with the top hat sitting in the corner of my room, and I wouldn't be able to move or talk from fear. He just felt eerie and dark. My brother and I would play hide and seek in the house and I would go and hide behind the water heater down in the cellar. It would usually have a tiny glimpse of light, but this time it was pitch black. As I go to hide, I hear kids giggling right beside my ear. I screamed and ran and my brother tried talking to me, but I stayed silent. Little things would happen throughout the time we lived there, like things going missing here and there, and then ending up somewhere it never had been before. But a few months prior to us moving out, I had been sleeping in the basement with my brother and my new puppy, Princess. We had a couch up against the wall, which is where my brother was sleeping. He had his face to the wall and back of the couch, and facing me. I was sleeping on a little mattress with my puppy in front of me and an ottoman that separated the couch and mattress I was on. We usually kept our remotes and game controllers on it. I was starting to doze off when I heard my name being called. It sounded like a little girl at first. Next thing I know, the ottoman was thrown across the room at least 20 feet. It was a fairly good-sized basement. And then the controller went floating, and I look over, and it slams into my forehead. I started shaking and pretending to be asleep. Even my puppy was playing dead. The next morning, my grandpa's sister called my mom and told her everything that happened the night before. I even told her. Then, the day we moved out was when my mom had her major experience. She was a night shift nurse, so she would come home, get us ready for school, and then get us on to the bus. After that, she would always shower and lay down to go to sleep. We had recently had a flood in our basement, so we had a bunch of paint chips from the painted concrete down there everywhere. You couldn't sleep anywhere without getting them on your feet. Well... My mom took her shower and lay down on her bed upstairs and had a dream where she woke up downstairs staring into the blue room. The blue room for obvious reasons. We called it this because it was painted a light blue and it also had a lock on the outside which you would find on some sort of cage but it was all busted. She then walked towards the room. The door was wide open, and there was a little girl in an old-fashioned blue school dress with a long black ponytails. My mom said she looked trapped. She then woke up from her dream with the paint chips from downstairs all over her feet. She left and never came back to the house. My dad and other family members helped us move that very next day. As we were moving, we came across some old pictures left by the original homeowners. In one of those pictures, my mom saw the little girl she saw that day that made us move out. Once we got to the new house, we ended up living there till I graduated high school in 2018. I would still encounter the man in the top hat every six to seven months. Nothing crazy at this new house, but definitely paranormal activity. Once I graduated, I moved in with an ex-boyfriend of mine. Never really noticed anything, but always felt the Top Hat Man's presence. 
Once I had broken up with my ex, I moved to Oregon with my mom and her new husband. While living there, I walked into the room and saw one of these stuffed animals from my late grandma floating in the air, and then it just dropped. I called my sister, rest in peace, straight away because I knew no one else would believe me. Later on, I went back to my room and lay down for the night, and I had a feeling someone was watching me. So, I look at my closet and see the top hat man staring at me. I could barely breathe and just laid there until he just vanished. I eventually fell asleep, but woke up the next morning with scratch marks surrounded by bruising on my neck. I still have the photos that I sent my sister. A month or so after this happened, we moved to a new place in Oregon as they bought a new house. After moving in, I got a very eerie feeling in there. We would hear people stomping around upstairs from the basement and loud thuds. We would hear talking and whispers. I ended up moving back to my state I lived in since I was 13. After I moved, my mom tied a rope from the guest room to the room I stayed in and the rope was completely cut. I now live in a house with my brother and his wife and weird shit keeps happening here too. I have a 10 month old daughter now and I'm worried it's going to start messing with her too. If you've made it this far, what are your suggestions or thoughts? Thank you for listening to my story. I've already told a few people this story, but I wanted to share it with more details because it got a little bit more attention than I thought it would. For reference, I'm a 19-year-old trans man. For those that don't know, that's female to male. And on my Lyft app, I just put my order name and gender because I could, as well as a nice selfie of me. So I'm in the system. I'm a guy. When I first moved in the city that I lived in for college, I didn't have a car and would ride my bike or walk everywhere depending on the distance. My work was a little under a mile away and my school was about two miles. So a 30 minute bike ride to school and 20 minute walk to work. I liked those walks and helped me clear my mind. But as these months got hotter, it became more unbearable to walk for even those short 20 minutes, especially when I had to go to work and I would be all hot and sweaty. I started using Lyft religiously once I discovered the wait and save option. Most of the time it wouldn't even make me wait that long. Sometimes it was even shorter than the more expensive option. I was pulling out easily 10 plus lifts a week between getting to work and everywhere else. Since I'm not paying bills living with my dad, I had a pretty decent amount of expendable income and was able to manage my budget to still have money left over after all these trips. Just in case you were wondering. A couple months ago, I had ordered my wait and save lift and left to wait outside a couple minutes early. I'm looking at my phone, taking note of my driver's car and my driver's appearance. I walk out to our driveway and see a very similar looking car to the little icon that Lyft gives you, a small white sedan for both the icon and his car. And unless you tried looking for the little details, they look pretty much the same. But luckily, I do, and I noticed that this was not my driver. Plus, it said on my real one, he was still two minutes away from me. I just assumed he was waiting on someone else, maybe a friend or a neighbor, or maybe he's looking for directions. Every possible logical explanation for why he's sitting in my driveway, staring at me, runs through my mind. I feel awkward. So I take the mail out, then go back inside the back door and sat in our kitchen. Go back out, he's still there. We make eye contact, 
and he rolls down his window. Maybe he's just lost. Let me see if I can help. The driver of the car was a Middle Eastern man in his mid-thirties, I want to say. I didn't think to get a physical description because I didn't think I needed to. He pulls out his phone, and it very clearly shows my profile that says that he's my driver. I look down at my phone again. My actual driver is a black man in his 40s. I guess through a tinted window, which he had, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but since he rolled down his window, I was able to. Now, I don't know why, but for some reason, I just trusted him. I've been living as a guy for almost two years now and passed pretty well. Creepy men had been taken out of my radar, the way women have to keep them in. I haven't been catcalled, assaulted, harassed, and just assumed that I was immune to kidnapping or trafficking for some reason. My first thought was that Lyft sent me two drivers, and the cars, being so similar, was just a funny coincidence. I tell the guy my theory, and he just asks if I wanted to take his car instead. I say, yeah, I guess I will since you're here first. Then the actual driver pulls up. He sits stationary in the street and rolls down his window when I walk over. I think to myself, this is awkward, like seeing your ex out on a date. And I toddle over to explain what's going on. I tell him I'm going to get in the other guy's car because he was here first. And my driver says I should probably go with whoever is on the phone. At this point, I'm just desperate to get into one of their cars or I'm going to be late to work. So I figured that makes the most sense. I was worried that one of them wouldn't get paid or would I have to pay for both. I'm still thinking this is Lyft's fault. I turn around and go to tell the original driver I'm going to go with the real one. It's the one on my phone. But before I do, he drives off. Weird. I guess he wanted to get out of here to catch his next ride. I get into my guy's car and settle in. And it wasn't until we started driving that he makes the point. So that was really weird, right? I hadn't thought of it like that. I metaphorically rub my chin for a moment and realize, holy shit, it kind of was. I asked my driver, has that ever happened to you before? He's been a Lyft driver for over 10 years and he hasn't. My heart might as well have stopped as the realization dawned on me. Oh my God, that guy might have been pretending to be my driver on purpose. That sudden fear that I hadn't felt in years since before I came out and lived as an attractive young woman, had punched me in the gut all at once. And I realized that men go through this shit too. My palms were sweaty, and I tried to make small talk to change the subject. We joke around a bit as I try to hide my increasing anxiety and paranoia. I tip him well, thank him, and he lets me know he's going to share what happened on a forum for the fellow drivers to let them know what happened. So that made me feel a whole lot better. First thing I do when I get to work is take one of my emergency anxiety meds with shaky hands, clock in and book it to our outside break area. I call my dad, tell him what had just happened. He tells me to make a report to Lyft and I do. When I called them, they took it very seriously. I was still at this point trying to rationalize as a server error, but no one had ever seen anything like that before. Not by experienced drivers, no one I knew, and not the Lyft representative. So, nothing. The woman I spoke to was really kind and I appreciated her genuine concern. She told me she was going to send me an email and to send any physical proof I had of the event. I didn't have any. 
I spent about 15 minutes outside and didn't tell anyone aside my dad for a couple weeks. The whole thing was traumatic, especially after I had time alone to reflect and think about everything. A couple of days later though, my dad got me a car. So, hey, big W for dad. I analyzed every detail. My anxiety took full control and made me a total paranoid maniac. My dad somehow managed to give me every ride to work while he got me into the car, which was a total surprise by the way. I did not know he was doing that. I think back on it still, the tenant windows, the timing, the similarity to the cars. The fact that no one has heard of this happening, the fact that if I had gotten in his car, we would have driven off and my actual driver would have just reported me as a no-show and no one would have known for hours later that I had possibly been missing because I was going to be at work. I did some research and the general consensus with this was likely a trafficker who had access to Lyft servers and looking for repeating customers like me. Someone who was so used to hopping in and out of these cars that they probably have their guard down a bit. In their eyes, I was a young, I like to think it that way, conventionally attractive male. It could have been for homosexual trafficking or labor, although on both ends, they would have been very disappointed. For weeks after, I carried pepper spray in my hand and a knife in my pocket and wallet. I also hid a couple in my car, which I realize isn't the safest if I get pulled over or anything. But so far, I've been fine. Still looking over my shoulder and avoiding lift at all costs, I deleted the app for a while. Stay safe. Read your license plates and check your gut. Not all of us are so lucky to have our real driver pull up at the perfect time. He might have just have saved my life. This story didn't happen to me, but I was a witness to it, and I think it's one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen occur out in the bush. We were camping in a more populated campsite, which was designated sites to book. This is called the Honeysuckle Creek Campsite, and it is gorgeous. It's the perfect spot to camp to walk to the satellite used to assist in the Apollo space mission. We set up on a Friday night, as we usually did, and everything went smoothly. On the Saturday morning, a group of 20-something-year-old guys arrived and set up a campsite just across from us. Their site housed a sheltered area with a fire pit, more so an open oven-style fire than a fire pit, but I'm not sure what you'd call it exactly. They weren't exactly quiet. They were somewhat rowdy, but not to the point where it was bothering us. As the sun started to set, they began to amp up, playing loud music with their speaker, drinking beers, and throwing the empty bottles into the trees. Still, they weren't loud enough to really bother us yet, so we left them to it. As they got their fire going, they took a large log, more like a large chunk of a tree, and set it in the fire. It was so big that more than half of it was hanging out of the fire pit and resting on the ground. This is very much against the law in Australia. We have very strict fire laws for obvious reasons, and one of the laws states that any fires must be contained to designated fire pits. If a ranger had have witnessed their setup, they would have faced a hefty fine. None of us were keen on disturbing the group, so we left them to their devices. While their fire setup wasn't very safe, it wasn't currently causing problems. 
We all slowly filtered off into our tents and were in bed by about 10.30 or 11. I could still hear them throwing their bottles, goofing around, and pumping their music. Again, while it was slightly annoying, it wasn't bothering any of us enough to go over and say something. I've always had trouble falling asleep and only do so now with the help of strong medication. So, as usual, I was still struggling to fall asleep, and I'd say it was around 12 when things started to get really weird. All of a sudden, the whole group went silent, and I heard one of them say, Did you guys hear that? I heard mumblings from the others, but it seemed like they brushed it off and continued on as normal, maybe even a little quieter than before. Not long after, I heard another, shh, 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 guys, guys, what is that? More mumblings from the group followed, and then a loud crack came from somewhere around the campsite. It was louder than a normal twig snap, but still sounded like some kind of branch breaking. The next thing I heard was, fuck this, I'm going to take a look and then heavy footsteps on dry leaves. Soon I heard faster, more hurried footsteps returning, crunching leaves and branches, and the same voice say, Guys, guys, what the fuck was that? I, I, I saw someone standing in the forest. The person began to describe what they saw, but I only heard bits and pieces as the wind started to pick up. Tall. Dark, creepy, were the words I caught. They all were hurriedly discussing what was going on when I heard a faint laugh. I'm going to assume it wasn't one of them because one of them then said, Fuck this, I'm not staying here. And more arguing ensued. The last thing I heard before the wind was far too heavy to hear anything over was, Fine. If we're staying then, I'm sleeping in my car. And a car door open and slammed shut. I think the others continued talking for a while, but at this point the wind was so loud, you could have sworn we were camping right on the beach, listening to waves crashing, and I eventually drifted off. I felt odd after hearing all that go down, but I felt safe. Nothing felt negative towards me and my campsite. The next morning, I was leading duty patrol, the patrol responsible for the cooking of that meal, and got up at around 6. I had promised my patrol members that they could sleep in until 6.30, so I figured I would start warming the barbecue and preparing little things until then. When I emerged from my tent and looked over to the other campsite, I was met with a sight I'll never forget. Everything they had left out was strewn about, rubbish all around, belongings scattered, even their solar panel was laying face down on the grass. Assuming it was the heavy wind, I looked around my campsite, trying to find anything amiss, but saw nothing. Cups left on our tables were where they were the night before. Bits and pieces from the kitchen were all in their place. Thinking that was strange, I glanced over at their campsite again. Their fire pit was full of soft dirt with the logs still hanging out of it. Something that was kind of odd but potentially could have been them. It's an uncommon way to put out a fire, but not so uncommon that this is 100% part of the paranormal. What was strange, however, was the pile of empty beer bottles neatly arranged on the ground next to the fire pit. I thought it was all pretty odd, but I continued on about my duties. Around 6.30, I went to go get my patrol members from their tents when the man who slept in his car emerged from the back seat. He looked around the campsite and said, No, bro. What the fuck? And woke his companions. 
They all looked around as the car guy was ranting about how messed up the situation was, urging them to leave. As they were looking around, another noticed something on the car. Bro, look, he said, pointing to the iced up windshield. Are those fucking handprints? Fuck this, I'm leaving whether you see you next Tuesdays are coming with me or not. If you are wondering if this much of swearing is embellished, I urge you to remember we are in the Australian bush and there were 20 somethings wearing akubras and work boots. The boys packed up camp mighty fast. We're out of there in under an hour. Nothing happened to us the entire time. And this honestly gives me a bit of a laugh just thinking about it again. I truly think they upset something out there and it gave them a strong message. Danny H. We were teenagers. He was 25. He asked for money, stalked us, offered us illegal substances, tried getting us to buy alcohol and stole. Let's not meet again. True life story. This story happened around October, November of 2016. I was with a friend. We were best friends at the time. We became best friends around October 2014 while at school. After she moved down to the same area as me and joined the same school and we stayed best friends up until about 2018-2019-ish. We were teenagers when this story happened, just a couple of months before we turned 17. We were in town. We were meant to be going to college that day, but decided to not go and wandered around the town instead. Disclaimer number one, my friend was a lot more naive and innocent than me and hadn't had things as tough. I was like the more defensive, more aware, more logical and realistic one out of the two of us. If that makes any sense, she was more sensitive too. We were at the bus station, just minding our own business, doing our own thing, having a cigarette, looking at our phones, chatting, that kind of thing. When this random man comes along and stands by us, and then he starts chatting to us. He mentioned somewhere along the way that he was 25, almost 26, so nine, almost 10 years older than us. All we had on us were our handbags and rucksacks with normal everyday things in and a carrier bag with some things we had just bought, like snacks and drinks kind of stuff. Which he said something like, What you got there then? And peeped his head in. Then carried on something like, Ah, oh, nice, little snacks and stuff. He asks if we have a bit of change for the bus. I think he only asked for about 10p or something like that. I decided to give him some change out of decency and to see if he'd go away. We didn't really want to interact with him, but we were trying to be pleasant. I thought it seemed a little bit weird or odd and or dodgy from the start. He hangs around. He didn't really have anything with him at all. He then pulls out some small blue tablets from his jean pockets and say that they were Valium, also known as Diazepam, and offer them to us. But I didn't believe it. Me and my friend looked at each other like, what the fuck? And of course said no. I wasn't gonna let that happen. This was a public area during the daytime and there was other people around too so it was a risky thing for him to do but i thought to myself that it was good for us in case we needed help or witnesses he also asked for our names my name is shannon and my friend's name is only a short name and starts with an r for this story i'm just gonna call her roxy 
We made up that we were all called Shauna and Roxy in this situation, as we didn't want to tell him our real names. Disclaimer number two, my dad got heavily into substance and alcohol a bit before I was born and was in and out of jail. This went on for years and he died of an overdose the day before my 10th birthday. My mom always spoke to me about it and told me the truth and I was brought up in the real world, so to speak kind of thing. So I'm very aware about that kind of stuff and the kind of things that can happen in the world. Once this happened, me and my friend decided to walk back into town up the high street. He followed us along the way back into the main part of town, which was only a couple of minutes, if that, from the bus station. We thought we'd be safer, better, and even more public, or there would be security cameras in shops too, as well as more people, just in case anything happened. We only got part way up the high street and decided to walk into Tesco Express. He still followed us. He bumped into someone along the way who was called his uncle and he tagged along too, which was all very weird. While we were in Tesco Express, he tried asking us for money for alcohol. I gave him a little bit more change to try and get him to shut the fuck up and leave us alone or something. He tried pressuring and convincing us to buy alcohol, even though we were underage. We said no multiple times. A member of staff behind the counter did look at and watch us while this happened, but didn't do anything. She was serving someone at the time, but she was aware. Me and my friend walked out. As we were walking away, he picked up a beer bottle from the fridge section, put it under his jacket, put his arm around his so-called uncle, and walked out with it. How the alarms didn't go off, I have no idea. Sadly, there wasn't a security guard on duty or around at the time to witness this. As me and my friend got outside, just before he came out, we stopped to try and figure things out. Then he obviously came up to us again. We were trying so hard to be pleasant, cool, calm, and casual. We start walking up the high street and he continued to follow us and tried to talk to us, making conversation, etc. As we got to the indoor shopping center in the mall, he came in beside us, and there happened to be a stall inside the quirky little ornaments and things for sale. He sneakily picked up one as we went by and was going to steal it. He then turned back as if he was going to take it back or something. We were trying so hard this whole time to hardly interact with him as little as possible. As he turned back, me and my friend didn't look back. We just started speed walking and went as quickly as we could to the toilets. Luckily, there was a fair few shops and, and quite a few people about in town this day. It was nice weather, so people were out and about. This was good, so we could blend in and get through, etc. We got to the toilets, stayed in there for a couple of minutes. I think my friend started messaging a friend or her boyfriend at the time or something like that. After a couple of minutes of standing, waiting, and chatting in the toilet, we then decided to go out the back of the shopping center, around the corner a bit and have a cigarette, while my friend was also messaging someone. She was almost pretty much crying and getting emotional. I was doing my best to stay calm. Also at the back of the shopping center, there is a bus stop and a few cameras, so more people and security just in case, which is good. We then walked back through the shopping center, through the front, outside, up a lane, looped around, and then back onto the high street. But before we got to the end of the lane to the high street, we saw him just going to walk by. So we stopped part way up this lane, hoping he'd 
carry on and not see us. Unfortunately, he turned his head, looked up the lane, and saw us, which concerned us. We dreaded it. I was hoping he'd still just carry on, forget about it, and leave us alone. He then said, Hey, or Oi, something like that, and came up to us again. He said something like, What, what are you doing? Where are you going? And kept trying to make conversation. So we ended up walking back onto High Street with him, still there. He was very, very persistent. But somehow we managed to divert, blend in with other people, lose them, and got away. Luckily, we went to KFC, sat down, and got some food. We were worried we were going to see him again. While we were in there, we looked him up on Facebook as we found out his name during this situation. We made sure to block all of his accounts. He had two Facebook accounts at the time. We didn't see him again for the rest of the time that we were in town. We bumped into another friend along the way. But later on, while we were still in town, close to 5 o'clock to 5.30 p.m.-ish, while we were still with our other friend, we bumped into and telling them the situation. As we were walking down towards the bottom of High Street, towards the bus station again, we saw a man sitting on the floor, looked rough and dodgy, not much with him and we realized it was the man that he had claimed to be his uncle earlier on when everything happened. Luckily, he didn't look at us, notice or recognize us, so we just carried on. We saw him a couple of times afterwards in town over time. I've seen him a few times over the years in town still. Once I was in KFC by myself, around 2017, 2018, and he came through and was asking for some change again. I said no this time. Luckily, he never recognized us, remembered us, or what happened, and never approached us again, or anything of the sort. In a way, I'm glad it happened to us, and while I was there, rather than someone else, because someone else could have been led further down a dark path or said yes to the substance and alcohol or been taken in more by him. I'm glad I'm very aware, realistic and logical. It could have been so different or so much worse. He definitely didn't have good intentions, but I dread to think who else or how many others he's done this to or something similar to or worse. I also looked him up online, back then and still. There's a few articles about him and things that he's done locally. He has been to jail once since that I know of. I also found that he had more Facebook accounts, in which I blocked. So, dear Danny H, addict, thief, criminal, stalker, generally unpleasant person. Let's not ever meet again. When I started dating my wife, I was 15, and her stepdad gave me this rock that had a dragon carved into it. It was cool, actually, and was very heavy. I took it home and placed it in my room inside my entertainment center. As time went by, it became difficult to get a good night's sleep. I would wake up constantly and have trouble getting back to sleep during the same time I had increasingly suicidal thoughts. I started withdrawing myself from my family. One day, I was watching my small nephew, and I was sitting outside on the phone and I was peering through the window to keep an eye on my nephew, who was sleeping on the couch, when, all of a sudden, a small dark shadow about four feet tall went from one room into my room. I immediately got chills and was too afraid to go back inside. 
Another time, I was sleeping in my room, and I woke up to the same shadow standing over me, and I couldn't move or say anything. The moment I started praying, it descended onto my bed, and I was able to move again. I got up and ran out of the room and fell asleep on the couch. One day I was watching a program about hauntings, and they had mentioned how a demon attached itself to a doll. That's when it clicked on me, that everything started happening once I got that rock dragon from my girlfriend's stepdad. I opened my entertainment center, and it was gone. I looked everywhere for it and never found it, but since it disappeared, everything stopped. I was myself again and no more shadow people or night terrors. There is one only small note, and I'm not sure if it's related or not, but during this time, I developed type 2 diabetes. I always wondered if that had anything to do with it. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true scary stories. Before I go on any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S, Kwame Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for continuing to be the pillars on which Back to Ashes stands. And for the other subscribers or just listeners, thank you so much for supporting the channel. For without all of you, I would not have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.